You can tell tales, and they certainly do that well, with lots of imagination. But when you get down to the real evidence, you see things getting a little bigger, a little bumpier, and varying about basic designs. And that's the principle of stasis that we see continually illustrated in the fossil record. Let's go back to Darwin's day and notice his view of the fossil record. Many people think Darwin was convinced by that evidence, but that's not what convinced him at all. In fact, that was a problem. Quoting from Origin of the Species, he says, innumerable transitional forms must have existed, but why do we not find them embedded in the countless, number, in countless numbers in the crust of the earth? Why is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Now, he doesn't have good answers to that. He thinks, well, with further collecting, they will be filled, but that prediction has failed. He says, geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. This is perhaps the greatest objection which can be urged against my theory. Now, Darwin wasn't convinced by the fossil record. The fossil record was the greatest objection that could be urged against his theory, which he himself acknowledged, though he predicted those gaps would be filled in. And some have pointed out, well, this is a quotation from over 100 years ago, and now then we've learned a lot more. And surely over the years it's gotten better. No, just the opposite is true. Notice the admission by David Rapp, who is uh, curator of invertebrate paleontology from the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History, professor there at Columbia of geology. He says, Darwin was completely aware of this. He was embarrassed by the fossil record because it didn't look the way he predicted it would. And then he continues, well, we're now 120 years after Darwin. The knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hadn't changed much. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's day. He predicted it would get better. The prediction failed. It's gotten worse. And he specifically mentioned some of those things that Darwin thought did have links that really don't. They have dwindled in number over the years. Rapp continues saying, by this I mean some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil record, such as the evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. Did you know that had been discarded? It had to be changed? Well, the evolution of the horse in North America is one of the classic examples that you see in all the textbooks. But here is uh, the curator, one of the curators of the fossil museum in America that has more fossils than any other museum in the country that says, no, you had to, to discard this. Uh, and leading authorities know this. We see this in the textbooks. Uh, most would say the first one that's in most of the lineups uh, really didn't lead to the horse anyway. They led to Eohippus, but of course it, it's just which similarities you look at and which authority arbitrarily uh, says it went this way or that way. Basically, you've got big horses and little horses. We see that today, and we see even some with extra toes on them still around today. Colin Patterson of the British Museum of Natural History, and this is the museum that has the most fossils in all the world, and he's the senior paleontologist. Uh, he's being quoted here in Harper's Magazine. He said there have been an awful lot of stories, some more imaginative than others. The most famous example still on exhibit downstairs is the exhibit on horse evolution prepared 50 years ago. Now, it's still there in the museum. But this is an example of the stories, the imaginative type stories that are being told. He says uh, th that uh, this has been presented as the literal truth in textbook after textbook he says, now, I think that is lamentable, particularly when the people who propose those kinds of stories may themselves be aware of the speculative nature of some of that stuff. It's still in the textbooks. It's speculative. It's a lamentable story, according to perhaps the leading authority in the world, certainly one of the leading authorities in the world. Uh, but like what we saw a moment ago with Haeckel's drawings, it's just very hard to get out of the textbooks. George Gaylord Simpson is perhaps the leading authority, or was recently deceased, uh, from Harvard. 
uh, on the subject of horse evolution. He wrote the book. He is uh, the most prominent authority in the field. He says the uniform continuous transformation of hydrotherium into aqueous, so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers, now that, that's exactly what you see represented in the fossil horse diagram. This picture in the textbooks never happened in nature, he says. Now, why do you have it in the textbooks? I don't think it should be there. It never happened, according to the leading authority in the field. The more we've learned, the more uh, we've had to eliminate even the few links that have been proposed as links. This is similar to the statement that Derek Ager makes, uh, the past president of the British Geological Association, writing the proceedings uh, of the Geological Association, says it must be significant that nearly all the evolutionary stories I learned as a student have now been debunked. And he goes on to mention several of them, including the horse in North America. One after the other, they have fallen, and as Rapp acknowledged, we've got fewer now than we had in Darwin's day when he predicted there would be more. Ager continues, said, well, yes, these things that we've had in the textbooks have been debunked, and on top of that, uh, my own experience of uh, more than 20 years looking for evolutionary lineages among the Mesozoic Brachiopodia. This is his area of expertise. Now, you don't find many fossil horses in the record. Very few vertebrates, as we pointed out. But brachiopods, the marine invertebrates, you find by the billions. Now, he's one of the leading experts in the world on this fossil that you find by the billions. If you could find evolution, boy, he would be one who could find it. He's been looking for 20 years. He says, my own experience here has proved equally elusive. He hasn't found any kind of evolutionary change there at all, and he's had to eliminate some of those stories. But we're pointed to examples like Archaeopteryx in the textbooks. Here is surely a link. This is half reptile, half bird, uh, restored uh, to look sometimes more like that, but usually very much like a bird, and I think that's what he was, an excellent bird. But why do they say this is the, uh, uh, the link that led to the birds from the reptiles? Well, we look at the teeth, and they point out he's got uh, bird teeth, and he's got claws on the end of his wings. Some beautiful fossils now of uh, uh, better than half a dozen different specimens that have been found. The, the wings are perfectly uh, designed for powered flight, many would say. We look at the feathers, they're asymmetrical like flying birds, not symmetrical like the non-flying birds, they're like an airfoil. Uh, but on the end of the wings they have claws, and so we're told here this makes him primitive. Except we see modern birds that have claws, like the Hoatzin in South America, the cassowary in the juvenile form, and by the way all of the fossil forms we found of Archaeopteryx are juvenile forms, uh, have claws just like Archaeopteryx. But the teeth, look at the teeth, that makes him primitive, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> uh, throughout the animal kingdom we see uh, amphibians that have teeth and some that don't, and we see some mammals that have teeth and some that don't. We see some birds that have teeth and some that don't, and maybe some of you have teeth and some don't, some have pointed out. Uh, does that mean we're more primitive? Actually, what we find is that the genetics for teeth are in many birds, even chickens, can be made to grow teeth with the right stimulation of the genetics. They did have it, and they no longer express it. There's a sense in which they lost what they had, which is a downward process. Lots of genetic information necessary for teeth, but many things like the terns used to have excellent teeth, and they have lost it. Furthermore, what we find in birds in the form of teeth is very different from what we see with reptiles. Notice this statement from one of the leading journals about birds, the auk. Theropod dinosaurs, by comparison, have serrated teeth with straight roots and no constriction. Archaeopteryx has unserrated teeth with constricted bases and expanded roots like those of other Mesozoic birds. They had good bird teeth, not like dinosaur teeth, like birds. But the real clincher comes with a discovery made out in West Texas, reported here in Nature, 
Uh, we're told the fossil remains claim to be of two crow-sized birds 75 million years older than Archaeopteryx have been found. And no, I don't buy those ages, but let's just play the game their way and see how it comes out. 